Do you really believe that we're living in the days of Noah? Do you believe that we are the generation chosen to see the return of Jesus Christ? How can one deny when you turn on the news daily that more and more events are unfolding faster and faster, just like a woman in labor, just like the Bible says would happen? As a born-again, Holy Spirit-filled Christian, I certainly can't deny that we are the generation chosen to see the return of Jesus Christ. The question, the real question is, are you ready? Is your family ready? Are you ready spiritually? And are you ready physically for that glorious day? When we see our Savior, that, my friend, is the true question. It's Lindley Oz. You know, there are so many things that are fascinating when you look into ancient archaeology, one of them being ancient technology. Everyone asks, was there really ancient technology? Well, with all of the findings, I believe there was. And if you want to know my personal opinion, I believe that it was far beyond the technology we have today. Look at the Giza pyramids. Look at the many megalithic structures. So many people theorize how they believe these things were built. But in truth, many of their theories don't hold water. So let's take a look at Brian Forrester's article here called Granite Quarry in Aswan, Egypt, Two Unfinished Obelisks. It says that the unfinished obelisk is the largest known ancient obelisk and is located in the northern region of the stone quarries of ancient Egypt and Aswan, Egypt. Archaeologists claim the female pharaoh, and that's something you may not have known. I read that quite some time ago in National Geographic. There was a female pharaoh, and from what I had read, she may very well have been the woman who raised Moses. And not only that, but she may have very well been the great oppressor during the exodus of God's people from Egypt to the promised land. Archaeologists claim the female pharaoh, known as Hapsaput, sanctioned its construction. However, modern engineers question as to whether the dynastic Egyptians could have achieved this task. And here's a picture that he has posted. This is one of the obelisks. It is nearly one third larger than any ancient Egyptian obelisk ever erected. If finished, it would have measured around 42 meters, approximately 137 feet and would have weighed nearly 1,200 tons. Aside from the problem of shaping it, how were they presuming to lift it out of the quarry? So my question is, if there were no giants or Nephilim or their descendants, Raphaim, how would people have been able to lift such an enormous, heavy object out of a quarry? You can see a picture right here again. He writes that the above photo shows you the immensity of the unfinished obelisk. Some academics believe that the shaping of the obelisk was done with diorite stones, such as those seen above. There's 
picture of the diorite stones. However, diorite has a hardness out of 10 on the Mohs scale, diamond being 10, of 6 to 7, which is about the same hardness as the granite. Thus, this technique would be very inefficient. This is how granite was split in ancient times. Chisels, possibly of hardened bronze or iron, penetrated the surface, and then wooden wedges were shoved in and bathed in water. The swelling of the wet wood caused stress, and then fractures would appear between the slots. Now here in this photo you see, he writes that in the pit of a smaller unfinished obelisk, we can see the marks left by whatever tools were used to shape it. Diorite balls would be very ineffective at trying to achieve this, as they would tend to wear almost as fast as the granite surface. So, how was it done? And that's the question so many people have, not only about these obelisks, but as I mentioned previously, about all these megalithic structures. And inside the trench of the large unfinished obelisk, aside from the lame diorite pounder, we see the depth and width of the material that was removed. But how? And when? In this photo, on the left, we can see the ancient conventional technology of using wooden wedges, but how about the scooping method in the center? Some theorize that the latter has nothing to do with the dynastic Egyptians at all, but is the work of an older culture called the Commissions, or Commissions, who had sonic and or vibrational technology. By setting their tools to a vibration that would make the quartz and the granite unstable, the stone would naturally crumble like a sugar cube with each controlled pass of the device. Now, you're probably familiar if you follow my posts and my videos of all the information I have provided about vibration technology and how I also believe that vibration technology is going to be used in the end times, and we are in the end times, but I believe it's going to be used further in the end times during the tribulation period to control people. And I believe that this is going to play in to the microchip. And I showed you in my past articles, basically, how the microchip was already programmed to start doing things at 110 megahertz using vibration technology and sound. So this is a big question and that's the end of this article here. But there's no way that these people or beings made these things or lifted these things unless they were extremely strong and extremely large as we know the Nephilim and the Raphaim were. Now the Nephilim and the Raphaim received all of their information and their teachings about the ancient technology from the fallen angels who had sexual relations with the earthly women and when they had sex with them the women gave birth to Nephilim. Now later on the Nephilim's genetic mutations and creations are called the Raphaim so that you know. Now, here on Brian Forrester's website, we have another article titled Colossi of Memnon in Egypt. 
These are some more megalithic structures. He writes that the Colossi of Memnon, known to locals as El Colossat or S. Salamat, are two massive stone statues supposedly of Pharaoh Amenhotep III. For the past 3,400 years, since 1350 BC, they have stood in the Theban necropolis across the River Nile from the modern city of Luxor. And here's a picture of them. The twin statues depict Amnahotep III, 14th century BC, in a seated position, his hands resting on his knees and his gaze facing eastwards, actually SSE or south southeast in modern bearings, towards the river. Two shorter figures are carved into the front throne alongside his legs. These are his wife. Not sure how to pronounce her name, T I Y, and mother, Mutem Wia. The side panels depict the Nile god, Happy. Let's take a closer look at that. You can see the statues here, and you can see the carvings that he is mentioning on the side. These statues are made from blocks of quartzite sandstone, which was quarried at El Gabal, El Ahmar, near modern-day Cairo, and transported 675 kilometers, or 420 miles, overland to Thebes. The question is, how? The blocks used by later Roman engineers to reconstruct the Eastern Colossus may have come from Edfu, north of Aswan, including the stone platforms on which they stand, themselves about 4 meters or 13 feet. The Colossi reach a towering 18 meters or 60 feet in height and weigh an estimated 720 tons each. So with that information, he has a good question. How? You know, they were they would have had to have been transported an awfully um, long distance. That would be next to impossible. So the people who were transporting them or beings had to have been exceptionally, massively strong and very large in order to do such a thing. In this picture, you can see what he was talking about a little bit closer here. And that is the Colossi of Thebes, which we're talking about. He writes further that both statues are quite damaged, with the features above the waist virtually unrecognizable. The southern statue is a single piece of stone, but the eastern northern figure has a large extensive crack in the lower half and above the waist, which consists of five tiers of stone. The Colossi would appear to be examples of works that in fact predate the dynastic Egyptians and were created like other mysteries such as the Giza pyramids, Osiron of Abydos, and the 100-ton stone boxes of the Serapium at Saqqara by mysterious people who had lost ancient high technology. Now, just to give you a little bit more information on ancient Egyptian technology. Let me just share a little bit of information here from this article on crystal or crystallinks.com slash egyptscience.html. It says ancient Egyptian science and technology. The characteristics of ancient Egyptians are indicated by a set of artifacts and customs that lasted for thousands of years. The Egyptians invented and used many basic machines such as the ramp and the lever, to aid construction processes. They used rope trusses to stiffen the beam of ships. Egyptian paper made from papyrus and pottery was mass-produced and exported throughout the Mediterranean basin. 
The wheel, however, did not arrive until foreign invaders introduced the chariot in the 16th century BC. The Egyptians also played an important role in developing Mediterranean maritime technology, including ships and lighthouses. So the Egyptians were extremely important, basically the founders of what we know as technology. They were very intelligent. Now, I must say that I do believe not necessarily all the Egyptians, but particularly the hierarchy. I do believe, you know, the royalty, better way to say it. I believe that they were in the bloodline, according to what the Bible says, they were in the bloodline of the Nephilim. So, as I mentioned, the fallen angels would have taught them the technology that they knew and had. And with that being said, you know, about the Nephilim, they were giants. They were huge. They were powerful. They were mighty. They would have had the strength and the height to erect such megalithic structures and to place them where they needed to go. Now, some of the significant advances in ancient Egypt during the dynastic period, and the dynastic period was very significant. It was a time of increase in their technology that they had, but um, they include astronomy, mathematics, and medicine. Their geometry was a necessary outgrowth of surveying to preserve the layout and ownership of farmland, which was flooded annually by the Nile River. The three, four, five right triangle and other rules of thumb serve to represent rect rectilinear structures in the post and lintel architecture of Egypt. Egypt also was a center of alchemy research for much of the Western world. Scenes depict scientists able to work in fields of alchemy, biology, chemistry, dentistry, anesthesiology, air flight, and more. So a lot of the technology that we have today stems way back to Egypt, to the Nephilim. Egypt has always been a place of interest. The megalithic structures in Egypt have always been a mysteriously inviting topic that people want to study, research, and know more about. There's always adventure and curiosity about all of the exciting things in Egypt. So one has to wonder with all of these findings and all of the um, archaeological evidence to support ancient technology, not only among the Egyptians, but as we just researched recently, but in Peru as well. And all over the world are megalithic structures such as pyramids. There's even pyramids under the ocean. There are, in fact, three that are made of crystal that are right below the Bermuda Triangle. So these things are of great interest to people in general. And like I said, for me, they prove the existence for those who are in doubt of the Bible and the biblical truths and the book of Enoch and what it tells us. For those of you in doubt, these things should help prove to you that, you know, there were Nephilim and fallen angels. It's not a fable. It's true. They weren't aliens that flew in, you know, on a flying saucer from Mars. These were Nephilim who want you to believe they flew in on a flying saucer from Mars. Thank you so much and God bless you.